So welcome to From the Desk of the Executive Director, and we are not at my desk, unless my desk got huge from the last time. We're actually at a, a Coastal Family Health, um, one of our partners that we collaborate with um, in the work that we do here on the coast. For people who are homeless or living in poverty, I'm here with Will, who is their Director of Development. Is that your official title? Marketing and Communications. Oh, Marketing and Communications, Director of Marketing and Communications, right. Big job, yes. lot to do. So tell us a little bit about the work you do. Absolutely. A lot of the work that I do with Coastal Family Health Center is centered around understanding our patients and how to reach them. Whether it's through traditional advertising like TV and radio or through digital media, you know, on social media, on Google, Bing, anything that we can yeah. do to reach them. A lot of our job is really understanding how we can serve them. You know, how do we connect them with health care in this community and in other communities where they live? And you serve how many counties? We serve, well, that's a good question. Oh, I think it's the, it's the lower six. I don't know exactly how many, right? It's always the lower six. I know it's always the lower six. Gosh, but we do good. have facilities in Leedsville and Van Cleve, so we are a little bit further north. Leedsville? Yeah, Leedsville. Oh. Okay, Leedsville. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you all can get on your Mississippi map to check that out, right? Yes, you can find that. It is right. easy to find. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about the population at Coastal Family Health Service, because I think our our individuals watching this would really be interesting. Absolutely. Coastal Family Health Center serves a diverse patient population. Most notably, we serve patients who have no insurance. That's one of the big reasons why community health centers like Coastal were founded. So for patients that don't have insurance, we're able to let them use our sliding scale discount. So essentially the way that it works, patient comes in, say that they're working at a facility nearby. They bring in their pay stub, and we would base their, uh, their visit off of their income. The whole goal of the sliding scale program is to make sure that health care is affordable. If someone's not working, uh, we have a nominal fee um, that we're able to provide for them. And if they don't have any income, there are some other programs that we do have. Specifically, health care for the homeless would be one of those if they didn't have a residence where they were living. But essentially, that's one of the big populations that we serve. Aside from people that are uninsured, we also serve people that are probably insured, whether it's Blue Cross or TRICARE. Um, if people have Medicare, some of the public insurances or Medicaid, we also see those patients. We really seek to be a health care for every person. Whether they are privately insured, uninsured, we really want to make sure that we are that great equalizer mm -hmm. and that regardless of economic status or ability to pay, you have somewhere to go for health care. So how many locations do you have in there? So there are 12 locations. There are 12 health center locations, but we also have school sites. So the school-based health program is a big part of what we do as well. A lot of times when our students are within the school systems, they need medical care. And some of them have a regular provider, but some of them don't always have a regular mm -hmm. provider. So essentially for um, the Bay Wayne School District, Green County, um, Moss Point, and there is one more that, is, that I'm losing right now, but we, uh, we operate the school-based health program in there. So a lot of times there is a clinic facility on campus, mm -hmm. and um, that facility we treat kids for wellness visits, we examine the eyes, ears, the typical things like that, and then we also do sick visits. Mm -hmm. So if they come to school and they're sick, we can take care of them and make sure they're sick. Yeah, school nurses are always my favorite person. Absolutely. And the janitor. And the janitor. They are both very fun people. Oh, I would enjoy them a lot. <laughs> and actually, the person that took care of the milk, because I was a milk boy. I don't know. Oh. They probably didn't have that. I don't know we had that. I was definitely taking milk. I was taking milk to, to the different classrooms. So, curious, yes. how did you end up here on the coast? Because I know you were up in Hattiesburg. I was, I was. Absolutely. I'm from Gulfport, so I'm a coast boy, so I was so happy to come back home. I actually always wanted to work on the coast. You know, when I graduated from USM, there wasn't an opportunity to really fit what I was looking for. Um, so I ended up staying in Hattiesburg for huh. many, 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 many years. And I started my career at our sister FQAC, Southeast Mississippi World Health Initiative, doing the same job, marketing and outreach, a little bit of grant writing every now and then. Um, and an opportunity came for me to come down here and I actually work at Goodwill in South Mississippi for a while as their director of marketing and communications. Mm -hmm. And I saw this opportunity at Coastal, this was like a dream come true. You know, healthcare and specifically community health is near and dear to me because mm -hmm. there are so many disparities that people within the community. There are a lot of barriers to healthcare. A lot of times we think about money and the economic side, but transportation is a huge barrier as well. So getting the chance to do what I love in the community that I'm from has really been amazing. You know, we've noticed that with, our, with the folks we work with our population. Mm -hmm. Of those who are experiencing homelessness or living in poverty, is coastal is there for them, right? Absolutely. Um, and you also have 
um, a large motorhome? We do. Mobile we unit. We do. Yeah. That mobile unit is, it is an amazing opportunity for us. I remember working at Simra in Hattiesburg and I literally was praying that we would get a mobile unit. Really? I remember there was a grant application. I was like, Jesus, please, we really need this thing. Thing. <laughs> So to get here and they have one, it is amazing. Uh, and I, I love the mobile unit so much. It's because it lets us go to different places. Yeah. Um, with our Healthcare for the Homeless program, one of our biggest things that we use our mobile unit for currently is we go to the shelters and we're able to provide care to people living in the shelters as if we were bringing a clinic there. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot we can do. It gives us a great flexibility. It really mm. does. Yeah, I know on the onset of, of COVID, actually after I first got here, I guess we were a ways in COVID mm -hmm. at that point, but you all came um, with the vaccine, yes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't have a huge number of our homeless mm -hmm. population accessing that, but we felt good about that, of right? Course. We felt good about the intervention. Mm -hmm. And you also do HIV AIDS work. We under, do. Under Ryan White. We do. Right? right, so maybe say a little bit about that. I have something near and dear to my heart because I used to run an organization. Absolutely. We provide comprehensive treatment for our Ryan White patients. Our Ryan White program is one of our larger grants. Um, it treats HIV and AIDS uh, patients, and we provide a number of different services. We have transportation assistance, um, anything that we can do to make sure our patients are in care, and if they're getting the services that they need, we do. That service is available at all of our sites. We have an in-house pharmacy, so there are partnerships that we have to ensure that medication is affordable. Mm. We really try to treat the whole patient. Um, not only with Ryan White, but with everything, but specifically because we know some of the barriers our HIV positive patients face, we want to make sure we're providing a comprehensive program. We're also providing PrEP. You know, that's something that's relatively new, that right. pre-exposure prophylaxis. You take that pill, you ensure that you're taking it as prescribed, and it reduces your rates of transmission, or whether or not transmission is getting HIV up to 98%. So, right. it's, a great, it's a great side of other coin um, with that, that we, we do in the spectrum of HIV care. Yeah, it is. And having worked in that field, PrEP was just mm -hmm. kind of, they were experimenting with it. Exactly. Right? When, I, when I kind of was in that field, and I'm like, well, like, this has got to work. This mm -hmm. has got to work to stop the spread. And then, of course, we kind of, you know, there's so much of, with COVID, and right. they kind of was reminiscent, and mm -hmm. monkeypox, yes. and all that kind of crazy making, right? I agree. I yeah. agree. Um, well, I want to talk to you a little bit, too, because somehow Will found the United Church of Christ which Back Bay Mission is, is partnering and partnered with the United Church Press. So how did you find the UCC? And he's actually in seminary, right? I am, I am. So I found UCC years ago, years ago. Um, my own journeys with faith and really reconciling my faith and being a member of the LGBTQIA community, looking for a place where I could have that authenticity of identity was huge for me. You know, I wanted to make sure that there was a place that would celebrate who I am fully. So I was looking for different denominations, and it was hard to find, you know, in South Mississippi. Um, so I stumbled upon UCC, and I began to do some research in some of the work that the denomination did, and really the social justice aspect, and the inclusivity attracted me to it. Um, it was something that was refreshing, considering the churches that I've been at that are really not very welcoming for the gay community. And I was just really, uh, really impressed with it. And I started to think about seminary. You know, I have a podcast that I'm um, shameless plug as well. Got it work. Yes, the Got It Work podcast. I didn't know that. Yes, and it, but it was kind of one of those things that was another part of my faith journey. Really, the intersectionality of faith and career has always been a thing for mm -hmm. me. Whenever I look for a new job, I'm always praying and asking God, "What's next?" Yeah, and really living out my faith at work has always been something mm -hmm. that was very near and dear to my heart. But it's kind of like. Uh, a way for me to understand what preaching could look like in the future. You know, it's me preparing messages and yeah. looking up different translations of different things and looking at the way UCC has been present for the community that I'm a part of. It really intrigued me. So mm -hmm. I began to think about what could ministry look like for me. Mm -hmm. So I looked at some seminaries. Eden was one that came up. But when I saw the Pathways program, I was like, okay, this is interesting. It's affordable. I can take yeah. it at my own pace. Um, the curriculum looked amazing. The courses are very straightforward. Some of the specialty courses that they have, um, specifically around gender and sexual identity, that was yeah. super interesting to me. So you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this leads exactly where you know I want to be one day. Well, I, I actually took a couple classes at Eden mm -hmm. um, when I was at Concordia, mm -hmm. and the one class I took in particular was on liberation theology, mm -hmm. and I took one on feminist theology, yeah. queer theology. Yeah. 
and a womanist theology, and I'm telling you, I wish I would have been woke uh -huh. that time yeah. to say, no, this is this is my this is my understanding yeah. of the divine. This is my understanding of God. I would agree. Rather than um, the good, very conservative German. Oh yeah, theologians that I was learning under, right? But that's where I was at at the time. Yeah, and that's kind of what really what the spiritual life is about. It's I about agree. growth. It's about change. It's about transformation, right? I agree. And and that's pretty clear with you. I agree. One of the classes that I'm taking now is called Making Sense of Theology. And I was making sense. Making, it is making sense a little bit now. It's, it's challenging me now. I started to text you. you know? I started to text you and ask you, like, what would I help me make sense of this? But as I think about embedded theology and so much of what I mm. learned and been taught, but then the deliberate side of it of really taking that and dissecting it and researching it and understanding it and challenging some of my assumptions or things that I thought I was comfortable with, it's been amazing. You know, um, it's actually fun to see me looking at it and even some people that are not proponents of the community I'm a part of. I actually saw a post a few nights ago and it used to, it would have offended me in the past. But since taking this class, it's like, okay, these people have a different theology and their theology came from somewhere that they were taught this message. Maybe they haven't been exposed to another theology besides that. So it's interesting. I'm at the beginning, but I'm telling you, I'm leaning in. It, it, it's, it's cool. That's interesting because that idea of embedded theology, mm -hmm. right? Kind of what you were taught, what you were, what was shared with you. You know, it's for me so much now. So much about theology or understanding of God is, mm -hmm. is not nature; it's nurture. I agree. And now I tend to find more of my understanding of God in nature, mm -hmm. right? Within myself, within the spirit within mm -hmm. the spirit that I see around us, or working through human beings like you. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's fascinating because I kind of have to do the same thing when I talk to folks. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so you, you know, you, you're from this very uh, black and white, yeah. very conservative, yes. right or wrong, in or yeah. out kind of, you know, way of living in the world. I agree. And way of looking at theology. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, okay, so that's what you learned. Mm -hmm. I was there once. I heard it. Mm -hmm. It's embedded in me. And try to kind of work with that, right? Yeah. And so really giving people grace yeah. and mercy. I think it's interesting. And as I think about inclusivity, I think about it from another lens. Like, this is a journey. I want to be a minister. I'm learning. I'm going to interact with people who are different. I want the same inclusivity that they didn't grant to me in my community. So then it's challenging me to look and see how do I grant that same inclusivity to people with a different perspective. Exactly. And I can imagine it's not going to be easy, but it, it makes sense. Like, we have to give what we want even if we didn't get it. So it's, it's definitely going to be an interesting thing. That's great. So that inclusivity goes both ways. It right? does. The two-sided coin. It says the world is big enough, faith is big enough, mm -hmm. um, our community is big enough to embrace. I would agree. All of it. Mm -hmm. and, and the challenge is... Challenge is always that we're in that process of changing, mm -hmm. rearranging. Well, I will say one thing: when you find, when you're the preacher, and you're having to prepare the sermons every Sunday, <laughs> it's like writing a paper every yes, week. Yes, right? it is. It's literally. What does this word mean? What is the context of this? What what text yeah. did they use this in? What was the historical context? Yeah. What was really going on back then? Yeah. Yes. So when I first walked into a UCC church as pastor, right? Uh -huh. So I was. I was at the LGBT Center as an executive director, uh -huh. and then found my way to the UCC. And the UCC church that called me in Minneapolis, you know, it was this interesting church that had a, a labyrinth mm -hmm. in the center of the worship yeah, space, an oh, altar in the center, uh -huh. right, and chairs around it. Uh -huh. And I remember one of the first members came up to me and she goes, now we don't want to hear too much about Jesus. And I'm like, oh, whoa. wait, this is United Church of Christ, right? And she said, yeah, but we're a little off. <laughs> We don't want to hear much about Jesus. So like, what am I going to talk about? Right? And we don't want you to do scripture a lot. And I'm like, well, yeah, I use different readings and contemporary readings. Well, anyway, kind of worked with it. Yeah. You know, got my foot in the door yeah. and found out that it, it had a unique birth, right? Mm -hmm. And it had a, there was a very unique history there with that community. And then it became a bigger, wider kind of understanding mm -hmm. of the kingdom of God. So you'll, you'll find that very interesting. Very nice. I'm looking forward to that. Well, I'm looking forward to a lot more discussions around it. You know, I, you said intersectionality, right? Mm -hmm. There's that intersectionality of faith, of the work you do here at Coastal, mm -hmm. the work we do at Back Bay. I agree. Because really what motivates us mm -hmm. is 
is our love for God and our love for others. I would agree. Very much so. Yeah. Learning about the roots of coastal and how we started and some of those things around racial equity and ensuring there was access for everybody. Yep. When I sat in this very room during orientation and hear my CEO, Angel Greer, talk about people of color being turned away at local hospitals and active labor, it was mind-blowing to me. But for a organization to really pick up their mantle and serve, yeah. that's what I love most about community health centers, is that we never know who's going to walk through the door. The breadth of services that we provide, it's just not accessible yeah. for many people. And we even have a voucher program for people trying to access services outside of it. So I think it's important. I definitely feel like it's God's work, you know, yeah. making sure that people have what they need to live well and support their families. So the woman who was instrumental in it, her name mm -hmm. is Carla. Mm -hmm. Are you talking about her name? Yes, Carla. So she was actually at Back Bay the other day. She's mm -hmm. one of the women that walked in with the woman of color yeah. at the hospital and said, no, you will serve her. We're not leaving. Wow. That was back in the day, right? Yeah. So she's out now. Carla's probably, she probably shouldn't tell the woman's age, right? <laughs> that kind of gives you an idea, but she's this hardcore activist who continues to do that work, right, on behalf of those who at that point really didn't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So you're right, Angel is right. The, the, the historical roots of Back Bay and Coastal and some of these other organizations mm -hmm. around the coast were really born out of really born out of the civil rights movement, born out of pre-civil rights work, right? Mm -hmm. When we were looking for justice and equity, so that's really mm -hmm. Any final words for our viewers today? No, just you have somewhere that will serve you and ensure you're taken care of. If you know someone who is searching for health care, please tell them to look for us. You know, we're always happy to accept new patients. We want to make sure people have somewhere to go when they're not feeling well. And we want to keep them well, because we don't always keep them to the doctor when we're sick. That's right. Yeah, I hear you on that. That <laughs> makes us come to all people. Right. Myself, you guys are good people. Thank you. Thank good people. Thank you. So thank you for joining us. Um, and as always, support uh, Coastal Health, support Back Bay Mission, um, and support the organizations in your own community that do this kind of work in the world. So thanks for joining us. Thank you.